thank you. Thank you all for being here. And um, I was just discussing this. For me, this is an emotional event. Uh, happy meeting uh, my colleagues, uh, feeling uh, joyous at, re uh, at, 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 at talking together, feeling compassion, uh, listening to the stories of parents um, that have to deal with parental alienation. And for me, these are positive emotions that help me work um, with, uh, in my own country, in the Netherlands, where I come from, with alienating, uh, alienated families. And today, I also want to talk about emotions, but more um, negative emotions, emotions that parents feel after divorce. And um, I'd like to just like build it the first day. Um, I, I have to stand here, I understand? Okay, I'll stand here. Um, through a little uh, tour of history, if you allow me. And um, where long divorce was something that really barely ever happened, uh, we saw a steep incline in the rates of divorce after the Second World War. Simultaneously, we saw a decline of rate of marriages after the Second World War. And if we look at the rate of divorces nowadays in the Western world, it's about 50%. And about 50% of these divorces or breakups have at least one child involved. If we look at the beginning of 19th century, when we had this idea of the mother taking care of the family and the father taking care of the money to support the family, also there we saw a paradigm shift. Believing in monotopy, by the way, that's my mom and me, uh, where a child uh, attaches primarily to a, a single caregiver, the mom. And uh, believing in the tender years presumption, that's not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after divorce, due to these presumptions, mothers were automatically, almost always, granted custody after divorce. And then we started working. We, that is women, started working after the Second World War. And we started investigating, how is this? Is this belief that we have that there is a traditional responsibility mothers taking care of the children and fathers taking care of the, of the, of the money working outside. Is that biologically uh, an issue for human beings? And we found that it was not so much the case of biology, but it was the case of social convention. And whilst we mothers started working, fathers started claiming an active role in the lives of their children. And this also changed in cases after divorce, where more and more situations arose where fathers claimed the same active role after divorce. And in, in Sweden, for instance, we see that a lot of parents decide to co-parent. And we've already discussed that word, co-parenting, and it means about a 50-50% rate of the child being with the father and being with the mother. And we also see from research from Karl Main that this co-parenting is a protective factor for parental alienation. Because whilst all these changes took place, yes, question? Other was um, perhaps not mother, father, but perhaps with an aunt or with a grand, any other relative than mother or father. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, we also saw something new arising, or at least we, Gardner, first witnessed this in 1985. And he, uh, in his first publication, Recent Trends, recent in 1985, in Divorce and Custody Litigation, he explained that he saw that many parents were in litigation over child custody, over child rearing matters. And what he also saw was that his parents being involved in these custody litigations and over child sometimes blamed the other parent for the malfunctioning of the co-parenting. And even went so far as to make false accusations of the, uh, of the other parent. And what he also saw 
was something curious, what he had never seen before, a child rejecting a parent, not really having a proper cause for doing so. And about how much was it in those days and how much is it now, what's the prevalence of parental alienation, we don't know exactly because the definitions of parental alienation differ as well, but we assume it's about between 20 and 30%. And that it's bad, we know. We know due, thanks to a lot of work of Amy Baker and her colleagues, we know that parental alienation is comparable to child abuse. What we also know is that the emotions of parents after divorce, in high conflict divorce, but also in parental alienation cases, run sky high. So high even that they sometimes lead to fatal incidences where fathers killing their children committing suicide, or a child killing its father, or a mother even killing a social worker. And I just came from Holland, and three days ago, a police officer shot his almost ex-wife and two children and himself, and they all died in that incident. This is in Holland. This is in Holland. But not the whole slide, it's not in Holland. The uh, mother killing a social worker is uh, from the US. So we know, we do understand that this is a big risk for families. And we also understand that this risk is for a child losing one of its parents after divorce. Now I already mentioned what Gardner saw, that parents said bad things about the other parents, but also claimed that the other parent was an improper parent. They expressed co-parenting concerns. And we know from literature that the co-parenting concerns exist of I cannot at all communicate with this guy or with this or with this lady. She is horrific or he is a horrible person. And moreover, she or he is an unfit parent. But what do we know of the role of emotions in relation to divorces? We know a lot, a lot of research has been done in the role of emotions in intact families. And what we know in intact families is that intense negative emotions are related to conflict, which is not a very uh, strange thing to imagine. Uh, but we know not so much of the role of emotions in divorces, but what we do know is that in divorces, we have sort of two different kind of emotions. We have emotions that impair our self-regulation. We do not know anymore what to do. And we have emotions that make us feel the need to not talk to the other guy or to the other person anymore. Social distancing emotions. And what we also know is that these negative emotions play a bad role in our desire to co-parent. But what about the relation between emotions and co-parenting concerns? Co-parenting concerns that parents express often in parental alienation cases. Actually, I found no literature on this subject. So we took it upon us to research this relation. And we had a sample of 327 parents and we selected two groups. One group was of parents, divorced parents, and we recruited them through divorce-related websites, forums, social media, and social network. And we had a group of high-conflict divorced couples. And I used the word high-conflict because we do not know, we did not know, if these parents were all alienating parents or not. What we did know was that they did not get along and that court had ordered either you take an intervention or we place your child under custody. And through this intervention we got um, these parents, they were transferred to us and if they agreed to participating in our study they, we could take them in. We had almost equal um, distribution between fathers and mothers in this study. And most parents had on average two children, 
who on average were 12 years old at the time of the research. We had three research questions. And the first one was, can we distinguish risk groups by measuring the parents' emotions when thinking about the other parent? We had these two groups, regular divorces and high conflict divorces. From the regular divorces, we didn't know if they were high conflicted or not, but from the high conflict divorces, we did know. And our second question was, is the intensity of the parents' emotions related to co-parenting concerns? And finally, finalizing our theoretical model, we wanted to see if the relation between parents' emotions towards the other parent and co-parenting concerns differ between groups. And we predicted it to be strongest in the high conflict, divorced group of parents, uh, couples actually there. Our method, we had an online questionnaire and we uh, uh, asked of course for demographic information and we had two questionnaires, one on hostile emotions in uh, high conflict divorce cases, Likert scale one to five and the other one on concerns parenting and safety also scale one to five. We did our data analysis in SPSS and as we had partly nested structure we also did a multi-level modeling analysis and of course a multiple regression analysis and we did a factorial ANOVA. A sample was 327 parents. In the first group, the divorced parents, we had 26 parents who were at that moment in litigation, of which we know to be an element of high conflict. So we compare the emotions between these three groups. And we found that the parents in litigation did not significantly, the emotions of the parents in litigation did not significantly differ from those in high conflict divorce, but did indeed both significantly differ from the ones in a regular divorce. So we had two groups, one of 191. We added the 26 in litigation to the high conflict divorce. And we proceeded with our uh, research. First of all, we checked for gender differences. And we found none. Both fathers and mothers had a comparable emotional rate. And then we looked at the differences between the two groups we had created. And we found a significant main effect of groups on emotions. And especially so for anger, hatred, disgust, fear, <coughs> and contempt and less so for grief, for shame, and for guilt, the latter two was not significant. So we had these two groups, we had already seen these two groups of emotions in literature, and we found them also through our factor analysis, where on one hand we had this rage, hatred, disgust, anger, contempt, and guilt, which we named in relation to what we learned from literature, social distancing emotions. And we had a group of guilt, fear, shame, and sadness, which we named impairing self-regulation emotions. And we proceeded with our second research question, whether the intensity of parents' emotions was indeed related to co-parenting concerns. And we found this to be the case but only for the social distancing emotions. And we found that this relation, uh, that um, the emotions explain 43% of the co-parenting concerns. We found this not to be the case for the uh, impairing self-reflectory emotions. That was only a very small percentage that it explained, non-significant. And finally, our third question, is this relation strongest in the high conflict group? We expected this to be the case. We found 
a significant interaction effect. But to our surprise, we found this to be strongest for the parents in the regular default, as compared to parents in the high conflict modes. So now where does that leave us? Already yesterday, we spoke about the need to identify at an early stage um, possible parental alienation. And now we believe that we have screening tool at least to identify parents that are so high on their emotions that they find it very hard to co-parent <coughs> with the other parent. Because these emotions are related to the concerns they express. But we have questions, you know, why is it so that the interaction effect is strongest for the parents in the regular divorce and not for the parents in a high conflict divorce? And we figured some ideas, and I'm really curious if you can help us out there. We believe there might be a ceiling effect. That the parents had so high emotions already, they could not put it much higher, Likert scale of five. We also believe that it might be that the group that we had in our research of high conflicted parents did not talk to each other at all. So the social signaling function that these, these emotions has is, yeah, is gone because you, don't, you can't express them anymore to each other. It was a short talk. It was my first research. And I thank you very much for your attention. And perhaps I have some time for any questions. Yes. Yes. very interesting. What we did see is that in gender there was no differences and, and also in the couples. Yeah, so if the father was feeling the same disgust uh, as the mother did. So, but it's a very interesting angle. If Can you differentiate the, the emotions that parents feel that alienate towards uh, in comparison to the emotions that parents feel that became alienated? Yes, yeah, so you're right there. It was anger, rage, hatred, disgust, contempt. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're going to be, because we have this nested uh, structure, so we're going to check uh, if there is a... Uh, This is the first. This is the first study we're doing on emotions, and I think that we've got a lot of ground to to continue it and checking it against parental alienation. See if there are differences between the the, the one parent and the other parent, or whether indeed if I just I feel disgust for you, you start feeling disgust for me that we, that we infest each other. I, uh, that's what this the sec one of the second things we're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So that one of the questions 
difference in our research. This is a database that I got from my uh, professor, and I don't think that one of the questions in my research was whether they came from a high actual yield, came from a high contract uh, divorce family. But that's an interesting question, indeed. Um, what I would also like to see is a longitudinal yeah. um, uh, study on this. I, I know that the literature talks quite frequently that the initial divorce stage is usually a lot of anger and emotion, but after, let's say, a period of two to three or five years, most people calm down. And then it would be interesting to see what percent of or divorce, you know, what makes a person high conflict? And um, a person that, or a couples that are initially high conflict, if let's say they're in the middle of litigation, um, does it calm down? This was a longitudinal uh, research. Uh, this was the first uh, measurement, and there was a second measurement. Oh, there were. After intervention, so I, uh, you can't just distinguish whether this just by let the time fly away, that Mm -hmm. emotions there, maybe something happened, and I, I, this is one of the things that we can proceed on as well. Wonderful. I'm not going to be upstaged. <laughs> uh, my, my question is, <clears throat> it just occurred to me that every, nearly every state, I think most states, do have a requirement for parenting education, co-parenting education, when parents split, and in order for them to have uh, 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 some custody of their children, they need to complete this as a state requirement in most states. The point is that, uh, and uh, I'm the CEO of an agency I founded uh, years ago in Florida, and we provide education among other services, clinical and none. With respect to the preparing education, people in high conflict, particularly people who are so emotionally charged, do not learn. And if that's the case, I think that uh, it would be helpful to see an extension of your of your testing in, in evaluating the uh, the effectiveness of uh, of, of, of of these of these courses because the courts frequently require within one month of a uh, of a child custody uh, uh, filing uh, in other states it's within twelve months of filing and I would advocate that these courses should not be taught. Sooner, but there should be there should be therapeutic uh, discussions of co-parenting before courses because people are so charged they're not going to learn what the intention of the states are, which is a good intention. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the, what we have in Holland is the belief that parents cannot communicate. This is one of the things that uh, research indicates as well. But what we uh, also see is that when uh, parents um, are being taught to communicate, they still cannot communicate. So probably it's not the fact that they cannot communicate. There is something else underlying the fact that they cannot communicate. And one of the new ideas in Holland, uh, working together with a judge, um, is that we say, stop communicating. And see if the stress from communicating ceases and has an effect on the children. This is a new idea that we're uh, finding out in Holland. And I, I have got, I've got a lot of feelings for it. Yeah, I have no more time. I have five minutes if there are any questions.